Hello friends, it's Ben again. Actually, hopefully all of y'all have met me before. If not, I'm Ben Marlin, this is Calc 4. There ought to be theme music, shouldn't there? Well, this is a quick video here at the beginning of Calc 4. Uh, if you haven't experienced this before, the intent is for me to give you a quick synopsis of some of the material that you'll be seeing in the upcoming assignment <clears throat> and to work a few examples for you. Um, you can see I am not very formally attired today. My apologies, but in the drama, which is my life, the furnace broke down again. So I am <clears throat> trying to stay warm. <laughs> if you hear some noise in the background, that's a heater I'm trying to do the same. All right. So uh, what we're going to look at is some of the material from the very beginnings of the vector calculus, and it's really about vectors. If you have dealt with vectors before, you can probably put this on high speed and just watch it faster or something like that. Uh, if you've never dealt with vectors before, hopefully this isn't going too quickly, All right? Um, Another thing that I need to ask you all for feedback about is the resolution on this picture. I am purposely using a, an older laptop that has lower resolution on it in the hopes that I might discover something that takes a little bit less storage space and maybe a little bit less bandwidth for when you're actually watching this. So anyway, uh, yeah, let me know how the resolution looks can can you tell you know my classic rugged good luck good looks and everything are they are they up to standard okay so uh, what we're going to launch into here assuming i can get my uh, ipad sharing to work and that is always an if aha it's going to work. So I will uh, provide you with a PDF of these. Um, Y'all, that could also be something that might be convenient for you to give me some feedback about. Are these actually, is it actually convenient to have the PDF as opposed to just having the video? I don't know. So, so quick notion here where we're talking about vectors. Vectors are these things. From a mathematician's perspective, a vector is just an object that has certain properties. And so <laughs> they, they probably mean something a little bit different to me than what they mean to y'all. However, the models that we put to this abstract notion of a vector um, <clears throat> are what's actually useful, right? So if you're taking a look over here, I have put a vector V on there. I'm realizing that the color red on the dark background may not be the best of colors. And so, I, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't think I can change that right now. I can, but I can't do it consistently, sorry. All right, um, so this notion of a vector is going to have two models that we think about for it. <clears throat> the first model that we will think about is graphically something like this. It is a directed line segment. It goes from one place to another. It has, as the physicist would tell you, direction and it has magnitude. <clears throat> However, from my perspective, I just as often think about it just as some numbers that are in an ordered pair or an ordered triple or quadruple, however many dimensions you want to live in, you can totally have a vector there, okay? But I just have to have the X and Y coordinates be in the right positions. And so if you take a look here, I've tried to draw in a little bit, and it's probably not, not uh, good enough to see very well here, but the V1 and the V2 that I've got are 
actually uh, meant to show us that they are the x and y coordinates for this vector we've got, okay? <clears throat> and there's also going to be an angle involved here and that is labeled down here as theta and we'll talk a bit, bit more about that as we go along here, all right? But <clears throat> if you're thinking about going uh, some distance in the x direction and some distance in the y direction and you just put those entries in there, bam, you got your vector. Another notation you may run into is somebody writing v1i vector and v2j vector. All they're doing is separating things out in kind of a convenient notation way. Turns out to be nice for some other things we do later on. But <clears throat> i is just the vector that has a one in the x coordinate and a zero in the other coordinate or coordinates, depending on how many dimensions you live in. J has a one in the y coordinate. K would have a one in the z coordinate. I guess if you wanted to have an L, it would be in, have a one in whatever comes after Z. I think there's a Dr. Seuss book by that name. Well, anyway, though, so here um, you'll see that we've got this vector five, negative 512, okay? And I want us to do a little something with it here. Notice, first of all, that the idea of a magnitude of a vector is to take the square root of the sum of the squares. You cannot distribute the square root. If you could, I would tell you so because it would make my life way easier, okay? But um, if we're taking a look here at this particular thing, five, negative 512, and we try to figure out its magnitude, we'll have a square root. Let's see, negative five squared is 25, and 12 squared is 144. That means we're taking a square root of 169, which will turn out to be 13, okay? And then sometimes you may want to take a vector and multiply it by a scalar. And in this case, I'm gonna multiply it by 1 13th, same as dividing by 13, okay? And all we do is take and <clears throat> um, multiply each coordinate by <clears throat> that scalar, no big deal to it. But there is a nice little thing here in that if you are doing things in two dimensions and you wanna know what angle that makes with the positive X axis, referring to that angle as theta as in the diagram, then the cosine of theta will be the X coordinate of what you get by dividing by the magnitude and the sine of theta will be the y coordinate of what you get from dividing by the magnitude. And so the thing to do is to figure out your reference angle and what quadrant you need to put things in, and then you can figure out exactly what theta is. So usually you can just take an inverse cosine or an inverse sine in order to do it, but if it was in the third quadrant or the second quadrant, sometimes, I'm sorry, the third quadrant or the fourth quadrant, sometimes it can get difficult, so. All right, then if you take a look down here below, if you're living in three dimensions, everything is almost exactly the same. The one difference is that when you look at my diagram there, which is totally invisible. Yeah, let me see whether I can do this or not. So I'm gonna change the color to yellow. And yeah, yellow is much more visible. Okay, and um, in any case though, uh, when you're living in three dimensions, the only thing that's really significantly different is the fact that your theta that we saw up in the diagram above may, doesn't really have quite the same interpretation because now you can thought, talk about an angle that you make with the x-axis, an angle you make with the y-axis, 
and an angle that you make with the z-axis. Those three angles, by the way, are often referred to as alpha, beta, and gamma, and are sometimes called the direction cosines of a, a vector. All right, when you wanna do uh, that multiplication by a scalar though, everything works exactly like it did before. You just take and kind of distribute it through. So, so that's what there is for the basic introduction to vectors. Then we want to talk briefly about the notion of vector addition. Vector addition works like you would think it works. You have this vector here, one, two, negative one, this vector three, one, one. You want to add them together. You add the X coordinates, you get four. You add the Y coordinates, you get three. You add the Z coordinates, you get zero. Bam, that's it, okay? If you want to subtract them, same sort of idea applies. Now, visually, if you have a vector u and a vector v and you add them together, they obey what's referred to as the parallelogram rule. Parallelogram rule just means that if we took and drew a vector, which was a copy of v down at the bottom, a vector which is a copy of u over to the right, to make a parallelogram, then this u plus v in here would just be the diagonal of a, that uh, parallelogram that you got, okay? All right, so yeah, anyway, vector addition, just add the corresponding coordinates, doesn't matter how many dimensions you, that you live in, okay? All right, a brief little idea here of static forces. One of the other models that you can put on a vector is the notion of it representing uh, forces that are acting on an object. If you have an object which is at rest, then that means that the net force on that object must turn out to be zero. So we could have one, two, three, or 27 vectors, doesn't really matter how many that we talk about, <clears throat> but if the object is not moving, then that means that the net force needs to be the zero vector. So if we take a look at this example that we've got over here and we say, okay, I have an object and there's three forces acting on it. One of the vectors is unknown and here are the other two vectors. I purposely took their magnitude and direction uh, so that you could see an example of that going on. And you would say to yourself, well, in this example, V vector plus 10 times cosine of 45 degrees. You know what? I am not gonna write cosine 45 degrees because I know what the value of that is. It's square root of two over two. And so is the sine of 45 degrees, okay? And plus, <clears throat> And the other vector is 15 times, let's see, the cosine of negative 30 degrees is, uh, is positive square root of three over two, and the sine is negative one half, okay? So those three things, when added together, need to turn out to be zero, zero, zero. So that means that you can figure out your V vector by just subtracting those things over to the other side doing your vector addition. And so let's see what you get. Uh, negative 10 root two minus 15 root three over two comma, and the other part would be a minus 10 root two and minus a negative, so plus 15 times one over two, and that would be your vector. If you are in an actual science class as opposed to a math class, you will need numbers for those. Grab your calculator and do the numbers. I do not have my calculator with me. Um, actually, I do have my calculator with me, but it's just not real convenient to whip it out and do this. So if you would like approximations, go ahead and do them at your leisure. All right. So the next thing that we, have to think about is kind of uh, on the nature of the geometry of how things work in Euclidean spaces. We have something that we refer to as the dot product. So named because 
we use a dot to denote it. Later, we will use, we will use something called a cross product. It uses a cross. Ooh. Okay, so a dot product, <clears throat> the result is always a scalar. If you are taking notes, write that down. The result of a dot product is not a vector. It is a number. If you take a dot product of two vectors and get a vector as a result, you will get zero points on the problem you're working on. Okay, I'm saying that in a threatening manner because I need you to pay attention to that. It is such a classic mistake for people to make. So, all right. So when I need to take this dot product here, all I do is take one times three plus two times negative four plus negative one times negative one. Let's see, three minus eight and then plus one. So I believe that turns out to be negative four. Boom, that's it. It's a number, not a vector. Make sure you caught that, all right? All right, then the other big thing about dot products is that the dot product of two vectors u and v will turn out to be equal to the magnitude of each of the vectors as a product and then times the cosine of the angle between them. The reason why that works is uh, because of how the law of cosines works. I don't really, I don't want to try to, to run through that right here. If somebody would like me to, I'll later produce a little video about it. It takes about five minutes to run through, okay? But this nice consequence is that if you have two, uh, two vectors and you need for some reason to know the angle between them, the dot product gives you a pretty easy way, a pretty easy way to tackle that. Because I can look at this vector here and I can say, maybe that's my u vector. And the magnitude of that u vector I can do really in my head. It is the square root of one squared plus two squared plus one squared. So that ends up being a square root of six, right? And if we refer to this one as our v vector, the magnitude of the v vector turns out to be the square root of 14, okay? So if I need to know the angle formed by these two things, I up on top put the dot product of the two vectors. Uh, what's that turn out to be? Negative two plus two plus three. And on the bottom, I put the two magnitudes, square root six, square root 14. So that is three over the square root of 84. And you could simplify that into, you know, two square roots of 21 or something, but I don't know if that helps all that much. So that means that the angle that we want is the inverse cosine of three over the square root of 84. Okay, never use the sine because you get the cosine sitting there, right? Um, if you needed that in angles, I did this problem ahead of time to make sure I would get the numbers right. It turns out to be about 70.9 degrees, okay? If you need it in radians, you know, use your calculator and get it in radians. All right, cool. All right, so a couple of things to mention in passing here. Um, just objects that are going to come up frequently geometrically. And that is uh, spheres and planes. So your definition of a sphere <clears throat> is going to be that it is a set of points that are all equidistant from some center. <clears throat> and because distance is defined with the square root of a sum of squares, then that means the equation for a sphere will look a little bit like the distance formula, okay? So consequently, if somebody asks you a question like this, I need a sphere with a center one, negative two, three, and I want its radius to be the square root of two, you can just write down the equation of that with almost no effort. Let's see, square, and the square of the square root of two, Better be two, yay. 
Okay, so that, that covers the notion of spheres. And of course, you can have problems where you have a little bit more to do on them. Please make sure and take a look at examples in your textbook because they'll have kind of, you know, puzzly sort of things of figuring that out. Okay. Now, uh, I am again seeing that my red is not very effective there. So I'm going to turn everything inside of it into yellow. <clears throat> All right. So if you're talking about a plane, a plane is a flat structure that lives in space. And it's going to be sort of analogous to what a line was in two dimensions. You're going to have an equation for it that looks something like this. AX plus BY plus CZ equals D. But that's not going to come from slope, or at least, uh, okay, slope that you had in two dimensions told you about things that were parallel. The thing that we need to think about now is going to be things that are perpendicular. So a plane is going to have a normal vector, something that is perpendicular to it. And you would define a plane by saying the set of points x, y, z, so that the vector that goes between a point, uh, two points that are on the plane, uh, and the dot product of that with the normal vector turns out to be zero because things that have a dot product of zero have to have a cosine of zero for the angle between them, so they have to be 90 degrees, okay? So if I get asked a question here that I want a plane that contains the points, the point negative one, or one negative one zero, and it is normal to the vector two negative one one, then again, I can write it down pretty easily because it'll have to have 2x minus y plus z as the left-hand side of the equation. And then I can plug that one minus one zero in there and have what, uh, two plus one is three? Bam, that's it, okay? So if you're asking a question that easy, it shouldn't be hard to get it figured out. We will, of course, have you know some rougher questions. That's the basic definition sort of thing there. All right, I promised you earlier that we were gonna talk about something called a cross product, and this is what it is. If you look at it and say, holy smokes, that looks super complicated. It is. <clears throat> and then your next reaction should be, why is it super complicated? It's super complicated because this kind of a quirky, weird way of defining it will force it to be a vector that is perpendicular to both the u vector and the v vector. It will also have this weird property that if you reverse those two things, you get the negative of what you would have before reversing. So um, there is also another property I forgot to write down here that the magnitude of u cross v turns out to be equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Remember how it was cosine theta earlier? Now it'll be times the sine of theta. And geometrically, that will turn out to be equal to the area of the parallelogram that you would make by drawing the two vectors out, right? So that area in there is what you would get out of the magnitude of the cross product, okay? But notice it's magnitude of the cross product. That means a cross product will be a vector, always, okay? And if you are a good memorizer, I'm not, but if you are, then just memorize this formula for how you do cross products. If you are like me and a little bit more visual, then take your cross product definition like this. Oops, I circled the wrong thing. Like this. Think about making a matrix and across the top it goes i, j, k, and then put the first vector on the second row and the second vector on the third row. Now we're going to do something that's referred to as a determinant. 
you have probably never dealt with a determinant before and that's okay. You might wanna Google it and see if you see any videos that show you how calculating determinants goes, um, particularly if they're calculating cross products while they're at it, okay? But what we essentially do is to pick a row and we're going to expand across it. We will write down the I, the J, and the K because they are across that top row. It's always a plus for the upper left-hand column or upper left-hand position. And then you get a checkerboard going across, meaning that the J gets a minus with it, okay? Then these lesser square things here, these smaller determinants, sometimes referred to as minors, <coughs> um, those are obtained by blocking out the row and the column that the coefficient is in. So for I, you blocked out the first row and first column and you end up with that piece there, okay? Uh, for the J then, because you block out that row and column, then you kind of get those corners. And then for the K, since you block out that row and column, you get this square part over there on the side. Okay, so doing a quick example here, we will put our <clears throat> I, J, K across the top. Remembering I, J, and K mean uh, to, to do the one, zero, zero, the zero, one, zero, and the zero, zero, one. Then we put the one, two, and negative one across, and the three, zero, and the two across, okay? So uh, then uh, you can go ahead and do the little determinant thing, but I'm gonna look here and say, I'm blocking out the I vector. So I'm going to be doing this little matrix here. I take the main diagonal, two times two, minus the transverse diagonal, uh, zero times negative one. And I end up with four minus zero. Okay, then for the J, I cross out its row and column. And this time I go and do the transverse diagonal minus the main diagonal. So I end up with negative three <clears throat> minus two. Okay, if you can go directly to writing five, great, do that. Then uh, for K, I cross out that row and column and then I have to do this little square. I'm gonna do one times zero is zero, minus two times three. So I end up with just a negative six. So four, negative five, negative six. Okay, that's just the vector that we've got there. If you go back and check, now you can take this vector and dot it with one, two, negative one, and you'll get zero. Same thing if you dotted it with three, zero, two, you'll end up getting zero out of it, okay? All right, cool beans. Uh, once you know how to do dot uh, cross products, then uh, we can talk about this idea of lines in space. So lines in space, remember that planes in space were defined with just an equation that looks kind of like the general form of a line when you were doing things in 2D lines in space, we will have to go back and do things in the form of parametric equations. That's a topic you should have covered in Calc 2. You might have covered it in Calc 3 instead. Who knows? Okay. But it says then that we will say what X and Y and Z are equal to in terms of a third variable T. So here I've got this um, X0 plus AT of y0 plus bt and z0 plus ct. The abc that are sitting there is going to be a vector <clears throat> that is parallel to your line, okay? So if I'm asked a question like this here, where it says to find a line that goes through <clears throat> these two points, I need to first find a vector that goes between those two points and all you'd have to do with that is to say from one, one, two, 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 negative one, three, my one goes up to two. So I'm going to have to increase by one. 
my uh, uh, one here goes down to negative one, so I'll have to decrease by two. And my two increases by increases to three, so I'm gonna to have to increase by one. So one, negative two, one. So writing out the equation of the line, or the parametric equations of the line here, then you'll need to write down one of the points. It doesn't matter which one, okay? And then plus the coefficients of the vector, one times t minus two times t and one times t. And that's the parametric equations for that line, okay? <clears throat> that is what I would always advise you to work with. If, however, you are taking a look at some notes uh, from a different class, they might say something about symmetric equations of a line. All we do for symmetric equations of a line is to take these equations here and solve for t and then set them all equal. So in this case here, you would end up with x minus one over one is equal to y minus one over negative two is equal to z minus two over one. That's the symmetric equations for exactly the same line, okay? I will never ask you about those ever, ever, because they're confusing and have like multiple extra cases to deal with. So, all right. So then we're gonna look at another problem here real quick, which is to find the intersection of two lines, okay? So when you have the intersection of two lines, hopefully, the person writing the question will not have purposely put something mean and tricky in there. If I were an evil jerk, I would have put a T into these, in for these S's because then the thing that's going on eh, is that you might have something where you have a line going along like this and a line going along and they intersect, but the T value that you're using for the intersection turns out to be different. So, um, yeah. So maybe on one of them, you have to use T equals zero and the other one you have to use T equals two to get the same dang point, right? So just bear in mind that if you're asked to find the intersection between two, uh, two lines and they're parameterized with the same parameter, change one of them to a just a different name, okay? So in solving this, what you should note is that you have three equations and you're going to have two unknowns, your S and your T. So what you will want to do is to take two of them, doesn't matter which two, okay? And solve for the S and T. Then stick it back into the third equation, check to see if it works. If it doesn't, either A, you made a mistake, it happens. Uh, trust me, I've made lots of mistakes. Uh, you, you learn more from your uh, mistakes than you do from your successes. And I have learned so much in my lifetime. Okay, anyway, so um, you could have made a mistake or it might be that the two lines you're trying to find the intersection of just don't intersect. Later on, we'll talk about a trick uh, where you can check that sort of thing. But for right now, we're kind of going through it quickly. All right, so I am going to take right here and set my X stuff equal and that is gonna say that one plus t is equal to two plus two s. And then I'm going to take my y stuff and set that equal. And that's gonna say that two minus t is gonna be equal to one minus s, all right? So in that first one, I'm gonna solve and find out that the t is one plus two s. And in the second one, I'm gonna go ahead and solve for t as well. And let's see, I would have negative t, is equal to negative one minus s. So that must mean t is one plus s. All right. So that means 
that uh, one plus two s needs to be equal to one plus s. And that says that s had better be zero, otherwise this is not gonna work out. And if s is zero and t is one plus s, then t needs to be one. So when I talk about the point of intersection, I can go back to either one of these and plug in the values. So I know that plugging in s equals zero is gonna be easier. And so I get the point two, one, two. But if you go back and plug in t equals one, you'll find out you get the same thing, all right? So when you're asked to find the point of intersection of two lines, you're looking for a point. If the person who is writing it uh, <clears throat> does not think what they're doing, they might fail to write the word point. And so um, you might have to supply a little bit of the grammar there. All right. Okay, so uh, then uh, I think this is the last bit we're gonna talk about here. Um, planes, we already said something about what their equations look like, okay? So <clears throat> we're going to, now that we have a uh, different tool for it, the cross product, we're gonna be able to do a lot of problems that have to do with planes. Here, I want to find a plane that contains these three points. And so what I'm gonna need to do is to get two vectors <clears throat> that are on the plane and then I can take a cross product to find the normal vector of the plane. So I am going to get the vector that is going from one, one, one to, oh, to this two, zero, one. And that needs to go up one, oops, <laughs> up one in the X direction, down one in the Y direction, and to not change in the Z direction. I'm gonna cross it with, now I will take the vector that goes from 111 to 102. And it needs to not change in the x direction. It needs to go down by one in the y direction. And it needs to go up by one in the z direction. Okay. And so I'm going to show you how I visualize these. And this may be something that you view as a shortcut. So I visualize these like so. And now I can look at the layout for the X part. And I will get a negative one minus zero. And then the layout for the Y part, oops, I did it the wrong order, this way and then this way. And I will end up with a negative one for that. And then I do the layout for the Z part, like so, and I will end up with a negative one for that. That was weird that they all turned out to be negative one. Sure hope I didn't make an arithmetic error as I was going along there. Uh, let me check that, just, just to make sure. Let's see, uh, the negative one minus zero, and then the zero minus one, and then the minus one minus zero. Nope, I didn't. <laughs> All right. So I'm putting these back to where they were at there. <sighs> now that we have those, we can say minus x minus y minus z equals. And now plug in either point and, or any of the three points and you should get the same thing, okay? If, if you plug in um, the one, one, one here, it's pretty easy to do. It ends up being negative three. But if you instead plug in the two, zero, one, then you would get minus two and minus one. So you get negative three. I might tidy that up and write it as X plus Y plus Z equals positive three, but that's just totally me being OCD, okay? All right, speaking of OCD, I'm gonna grab that and push it out of the way. <laughs> and so, all right. Then the last problem that we're looking at here is to find a line of intersection for these uh, two planes. Now, 
if you have a line of intersection, then that means that your two planes intersected and the line of intersection lies on both planes, okay? Now, if the planes did not intersect, what would have to happen is that their normal vector would have to be the same, okay? So parallel planes have the same normal vector. Uh, so we want something that's a vector that lies in both planes. If the vector lies in both of those planes, then it is going to be perpendicular to the normal vectors of both of those planes. And yeah, my drawing didn't really capture that. But anyway, so uh, what you can do is to extract the two vectors and take their cross product. So that cross product then uh, is going to turn out to be equal to, I'm going to totally cheat, 2, negative 2, 0. Okay. And once you've got that, then you can write out your parametric equations. x equals x, y, and z equals uh, something with a 2t, something with a minus 2t, and something with a 0t. Oh no, I need a point, right? That's the only thing that's missing here. Now, trying to figure out a point. Look at our equations that we have here. We have three unknowns. I'm sorry, yeah, uh, sorry. No, I, I was right, three unknowns and two variables. That means you get to pick one of them. Now, these here, if you happen to pick your z to be equal to zero or anything, uh, then you can't finish this problem out, right? Because you'd have x plus y equals two and x plus y equals one. So you can't pick z, pick one of the others. The easiest thing to do, in my opinion, is to pick x equals zero here. And then you've got y plus z equal to one and y minus z equal to two, okay? I'm gonna add those equations together and have two y is equal to three. So y is three halves. And then the z that we're uh, taking a look at there um, needs to be equal to what? Negative one half, right? And you can just go ahead and plug in that y to either one of those equations and find out, okay? So the x needs to be zero, the y needs to be three halves, and then we got the minus two t, and z needs to be minus one half. Now, because we've got a plus zero t here at the end, we can take and just write the minus one half. This is the reason why you couldn't pick the z to be zero. Your z had to be negative one half and not change, okay? Remember my reference earlier to the symmetric equations for a line? Well, if you're writing symmetric equations for the line, they don't really work very well for writing this out because of this z equals negative one half, okay? And that's the reason why I don't use them. All right, so that should serve y'all as a high speed introduction to dealing with vectors and dealing with three dimensions and stuff like that. Um, let me know what kind of questions that you might have going into class. And uh, at class time, I will have some problems for you all to work on. Hopefully, we will have technology in hand where you can actually get to work on these things. If you don't, this gets harder. <clears throat> but we'll figure it out. Okay. My instincts are to be in the classroom. And now I want to say questions, comments, but... Um, Oh, I, I, if this were on uh, YouTube, 
leave the questions in the comments. <laughs> yeah, well, you have a homework assignment that is asking questions that you might have. So hopefully we will see each other on Tuesday. Take care. And then I hit the wrong button. So take care. <laughs>